I am Mike Wallace. I am currently the Chief Creative Officer for Harv's Global Entertainment. Uh, we're a design firm that works all around the world developing location-based experiences. But in a past life, I worked for Universal, both in entertainment, art, and design, and for Universal Creative. My journey with Harry Potter starts 14 years ago now, uh, was when I first started interacting with the brand on behalf of Universal Art and Design. I worked for um, Kim Grommel, I worked with Ray Keim, and we put together, along with Mike Aiello and plenty of other talented folks, the live entertainment packages for Hogsmeade at Universal Orlando. That was my first interaction with Potter. Effectively a week or so after we opened phase one in 2010, uh, I was with Universal Creative at the time and began master planning Diagon Alley. Uh, my title at that point was architectural designer. I spent a year doing all of the conceptual master planning, uh, working closely with Dale Mason and Katie Pacitti inside of Universal Creative to make Diagon come to life. I took uh, that role into a facility design management role. I relocated to London for almost seven months to work with Stuart Craig and his art department to draw over 1,600 hand-drawn uh, scenic elevations and details that became Diagon Alley. When I came back from London in 2012, I proceeded directly into the field and became uh, effectively Universal's project architect. Um, we called it facility design manager, and I saw that out all the way through our ribbon cutting and grand opening. Uh, my training, what I went to school for was architecture, traditional architecture. Um, when I finished my undergrad, I worked for nine months in a traditional architecture firm and realized that that was not for me at all. I was, I was copying like, you know, spec home railings for neighborhoods in AutoCAD for 10 hours a day and I was miserable. So I spoke to some of my former professors and they suggested that I come back for a master's degree uh, for set design for theater. And that degree track kind of opened my eyes to some of the other things that I could do with an architectural background, architectural understanding. And during that, uh, that degree track, I got in touch with TJ Manorino at Universal Art and Design. He, and I, I don't recommend this to students nowadays, but he convinced me to drop out of my master's program and move down to Orlando and start working for them directly. Through sheer luck and coincidence, I found a home as a 3D modeler, as a Photoshop illustrator, as a set decorator, as a technician um, working with special effects. Basically found anything that would keep my butt in my seat. And that eventually led me to a full-time role with Universal Creative and working on Potter. Being a fan ahead of time, uh, being a fan prior to working on the content, just added to uh, the enjoyment of it for me. I used to have the audiobooks on loop. When I was modeling, I just needed background content, something to, to get me through my days. And it was the specifically the Bloomsbury edition of the Harry Potter books, uh, just playing on my computer every day while I was modeling. All, all of the different roles that I had with Universal all relied around production. So my first role was 3D modeler. I was the, uh, the young upstart kid when I started. Not too many people were doing SketchUp modeling and 3D Max modeling back in the early 2000s. Uh, at the end of that contract, I started speaking to people about what else did they need. And my day-to-day -day became whatever kept me in my seat. So I would go from 3D modeling to AutoCAD 2D uh, production package work to Photoshop work, working on websites. Uh, I did set decoration, I did prop making, I did illustration, uh, all for Universal Entertainment. When I transitioned to Universal Creative, I was a combination of master planner and 3D modeler. From there, it became more architectural management, construction oversight, and art direction. I was able to leverage my background in building, construction, problem solving. Things that I built at Universal, um, I had a hand in four years of Halloween Horror Nights, uh, three years of the Universal Mardi Gras Parade, uh, a year and a half of Universal's Grinchmas. I worked on the opening ceremonies for uh, Harry Potter Phase 1 in Hogsmeade. Helped to design and realize Hollywood Drive and Golf. Spent the entirety of Diagon Alley four years of, uh, of work on that project. I was also the facility design manager for Volcano Bay. 
That was my project after Diagon. The, the lower lot in Universal Hollywood, um, I spent a lot of time uh, working with Scott Malwitz before he went back to Disney. I also had a hand in master planning Universal Studios Beijing, two projects that didn't take off, Universal Studios Korea, Universal Moscow. In terms of highlights uh, within Diagon, the, the standout for me, standout among standouts really was the Hogwarts Express. Um, that project came about by pure accident, really. I mean, it seems so simple now. Like, why wouldn't they do that? Of course, they would have built the Hogwarts Express. But uh, in reality, my task as a master planner at the time was just to figure out where we would place Diagon Alley within the studios, both within IOA or within studios proper. And all of my first drawings were actually in uh, Lost Continent, in Sinbad's Village, in that area, you know, right adjacent to Hogsmeade. So I spent probably six months just drawing the plan there. And it wasn't until we started analyzing some of the capacity studies and the, the park attendance metrics that we realized this really belongs in studios. You know, the studios park needs an anchor attraction like Hogsmeade was for IOA. Otherwise, it, would, it wouldn't see really significant investment for close to 10 years. So I started positioning Diagon everywhere. I drew it in the soundstage lot. I drew it in Men in Black Field. I drew it taking out Mummy. I drew it taking out Disaster. I drew it taking out Twister. And it wasn't until one random sketch of what it would look like in the Jaws plot that everything kind of clicked. It would do exactly what Hogsmeade did for IOA, which is cause guests to circulate all the way through the park to the back to go to the new thing that they wanted to see and then circulate all the way back through the park on their way out. So it activate the rest of, of the, the uh, spaces there. But it just so happened that when I did that sketch, I thought it would be interesting to include the Glenfin and Viaduct and the Hogwarts Express as a way to mask off our Diagon expansion from the rest of the park. I'm like, okay, nobody wants to be immersed in, in the Wizarding World and look across and see Krusty's head across the lagoon or look over and see you know the World's Fair for Men in Black. So. In my mind, I was using the viaduct as a way to screen the park in and, and uh, capture a little bit more immersion. But within 10 minutes of showing that concept to Mark Woodbury, we were already talking about whether it was really possible to build the Hogwarts Express. So I became a, an expert in 1950s you know, British Railroad for a little while, learned all about the turning radii of those trains, learned about the capacities, learned about who made them, learned about how heavy they were, and tried to draw a almost a Magic Kingdom train, a physical, real train that guests could get on and ride around the park. Of course, that, that evolved into, well, can it be a, a park and show like King Kong 360 was? Can it be um, an immersive attraction that also carries people to and from, a, you know, a fleet of night buses? Can it be a bunch of brooms? Can it, what, how can we get people from one land to the other and keep them immersed in the story? But for, for six or seven months, it was myself and Justin Schwartz, who was a, a young engineer at the time, just trying to solve this problem of this train is cool. How do we get people from one place to another? Can we really pull this off? Because to that point, no one had ever connected two completely different theme parks with an immersive experience. You would always have to leave the park, take yourself out of the story and come back through a different gate. But we, we managed to solve it with operations and, and a lot of trial and error <laughs> that train is the most authentic true to life thing that we've built I, I still love sitting in it and riding back and forth honestly from an architectural standpoint which was really my my key responsibilities the hardest part was figuring out how to make victorian era buildings that were meant to be held up by magic constantly looking like they are falling over actually be safe and secure in florida hurricane zones and you know, the, the additional regulations that the park puts on its properties and things like that, you know, that, that was by far the most challenging. And I think had it not been for my team of architects, my vendors, um, all of us kind of learning on the spot, how do we, how do we make this happen? Uh, I have a handful of interesting little tidbits and stories that always seem to come up. Um, first of which to kind of piggyback on the, the difficulty of building a place that looks like it's falling over. Um, the way we actually achieve that in the UK, in the art department at Shepherd and Studios, we started off by drafting every building at 
uh, three eighths inch scale and we we drew them all perfectly plumb and level we drew them perfect we then framed our model builders at the time framed every single elevation out of bass wood exactly as it would have been built in real life so if it was a wood building it was wood framed on 24 inch centers if it was a stone building it was a solid you know piece of foam core if it was a brick building it had a little bit of wave to it it was more museum board and we built the entire expansion we built all of diagon alley perfectly plumb and level at three eighths inch scale on this giant table in one of the conference rooms of the studio and then we had uh, Stuart Craig sit at one end of the alley, at the entrance to the alley, with a little lipstick camera seated, like just at pavement level, looking up the alley toward the bank. We had this huge TV behind the bank. And Stuart sat there at the end of the alley with Andrew Proctor, one of the draftsmen, standing in the model, walking around, pushing buildings left and right. And Stuart would look at this, this shot, this opening shot up the alley, and tell Andy a little bit more, a little bit more. Okay, stop, glue that one. And Andy would freeze and somebody would come behind him and, and super glue all the points of the, of the framework so that it would stay where it was. And we did that to every building down the alley until it had the right look and feel. The beautiful thing about the way that was all designed and engineered was that if Andy pushed on a building that was framed out of wood, you know, the, um, uh, the Butterbeer uh, facility at the back of, of Carcat Market, for instance, if you pushed on that because it was framed properly, it would it would shear and it would rack. If you pushed on Ollivander's, which was a brick building, it would lean and it would it would wave a little bit. If you pushed on Leaky Call Room, which was a stone facade, it would literally just sink or fall or lean. It wouldn't really change its shape. Doing that meant that every single building aged and fell the way that it was supposed to age and fall, which was completely blew my mind, but it was just a smaller scale version of what they do for the films. Every film set was built plumb and level, but it was attached to scaffolding pipe and tied back to a scaffold that was about six feet behind it. And Stuart did the exact same thing. He would stand in the set, look up, and tell the riggers to push out top of the building, push out the left, push out the middle, you know, bring this piece back. And he just applied that to a smaller scale. Another piece that I, a little tidbit, revolves around... Um, Warner Brothers approvals and how stressful that time is for all of us. I was inside Leaky Cauldron and a Warner Brothers approval was happening, an approval walk that I wasn't aware of. And I'm I'm standing kind of where the cauldron itself is for people who are familiar with the with the seating arrangement inside Leaky Cauldron. And through the queue to my left comes Warner Brothers VPs, comes some people um, Bob Whitecamp, who's unfortunately passed away uh, since then, comes walking through, and we go, "Oh no, one of those here. We're we're not we're not ready. I, I haven't had time to go and treat the serious black wanted poster that was on the wall. And if they see this thing that's a bright monitor, you know, there's going to be notes on it, and I can't afford for there to be notes. I need this building to sign off next week, that kind of thing. And the closest thing to me was one of the brown paper napkins." inside the utensil holder on the table so before they managed to walk all the way into the shop i ran over grabbed the napkin opened up the case that held the, the monitor unfolded the napkin shoved it in there and slammed the door on that monitor but that thin brown napkin gave the perfect age and perfect color tone to that serious black wanted poster and it it saved the walkthrough for that one piece. We got the little check mark for Serious Black Wanted poster. Even the last time I went back to Diagon, which has it was seven years since it was open, I was back earlier this year. That napkin is still there, and not only is the napkin still there, the frame inside of it has been cleaned. So someone at Universal Tech Services opened that case, cleaned the glass, replaced my napkin, and closed the case again. It's the most ridiculous thing ever, but I'm like, I'll tell everybody who walks through there with me, I'm like, hey, that's my napkin. Working with the film team in London was probably, was and is probably still the highlight of my entire design career. I don't know that I've ever seen a, a team of people work more seamlessly together than Stewart's art department. And granted, they had all been together, most of them for 10 years or more, working on all the films. 
we just so happened to get lucky that all of them were coming off of films right as we needed them to start on Diagon. So we reassembled probably 85, 90% of the original art department from the, the eight films. And Stuart led them in the calmest, most collected, most brilliant way I've ever seen. He told me something very early on that has stuck with me to this day, which is the first thing we have to do is design this perfectly. We have to design this the best possible way that it could be built. Budgets aside, schedules aside, what would this be like if we had all the time in the world and all the money in the world? And from that vision of perfection in his mind, we can work back to what it eventually would become. Because his team was as good as they were, they were fast enough to be able to do that. They gave him drawings of perfection and then they worked back to what we could build. And they all just know exactly what they have to do. They're all brilliant at it. You can't discern one person's handwriting from another because they've all been trained so specifically to do this job the way that they've been told to do it. And it just, it amazed me to see that level of quality from a group of people who, aside from Stuart, who was 71 years old at the time, everybody else is kind of in their 20s and 30s but they're doing this incredible, incredible work. The one comment that sticks out in my mind that I, I took to heart from Stuart was he looked at the way that we worked internally at Universal and his, his quiet, most Stuart-like comment he could have made to us was that, wow, Universal accomplishes a lot in spite of itself. And that, that I was like, oh, that's a good way of looking at it. The inevitable tall, tall person question of how, how Hagrid-like did you become over the course of a project um, so in working on the Interactive One program, I ended up with a number of the uh, infrared reflectors just kind of sitting around my desk. And granted, there was a team of engineers much smarter than I am actually figuring out the back-end software of these things. But for me, when I saw the little reflectors, I went, this is, this is the only tech, this is what has to happen on the guest side of things to make this interactive real. And I started putting those reflectors in and on everything that I could get my hands on. So my my day to day with the reflector was I had put it into a universal creative ballpoint pen. So I shoved it into the end of the pen so I could cap it, wear it on my lanyard. And as I was walking around doing any kind of testing, I'd walk in front of a wand window, pop the cap off my pen, do some magic, cap the pen back and go about my day. The, the Hagrid's umbrella idea actually came from a random walk that I made past uh, then director of entertainment Ray Stein's office. Um, he was working on a grand opening moment that involved giving a hundred school age children each a replica of Hagrid's pink umbrella to do a tapping of the bricks to officially open the land. It was an idea that never came to fruition. You know, the, the grand opening became a, a bit more of a media spectacle, but less um, personal. Uh, in that sense, but it meant that there were a hundred replicas of Hagrid's umbrella sitting in this office going unused. So I walked past those a couple of times and, you know, eventually I said, Hey, you know, Ray, can I, can I borrow a couple of those just to play with? And he said, uh, yeah, you know, some people are going to want them to display in their offices, but take five of them and, and you know, do what you want with them. So I took five, I brought them back to my desk. I started playing around with what the wand tip, the, the umbrella tip actually contained, which was a little rubber cap and a little steel rod and some other things. And using a borrowed Dremel tool from one of the engineers, hollowed out the end of this wand, put the IR reflector into it, and I had myself a working Hagrid's umbrella to do wand magic, which was perfect for me because at six foot seven, I, I can walk around and people see the pink umbrella kind of, I, I would carry it around in the sling strap of my iPad, which I was on the job site with. So I had this umbrella, pink umbrella on me at all times. And whenever somebody asked, what was that for? I would take it out and walk to the nearest window, perform some magic with it and put it back. And I tried briefly to get it adopted by merchandise. I felt like that would be a really cool thing to sell would be a version of Hagrid's umbrella in the park, but never ended up panning out. So I have two of the only functioning interactive wand pink umbrellas and, and the rest have been kind of handed out to 
friends and, and super fans that I've met since then, between then and now. How, how my career was affected by Potter. Um, it's interesting because I, I don't know that many people in the industry would ever get a chance to work on something at this scale. Prior to Hogsmeade, no theme park was doing anything at this scale. Nobody was doing a fully immersive land. It was always you know, the, the Walt Disney idea of, here's your place, but you can always see out of your place to the next thing. I want to keep you moving. I want to keep you, you know, flowing through the park in a certain way. Hogsmeade was the first opportunity that we had to build something that would hold you, that you could feel comfortable in for three, four, five hours at a time. You know, a land that you would visit and never really even need to go on the ride. You just wanted to be in that space, listen to the music, eat the food, shop at the stores. And that that paradigm shift kind of happened overnight, really, where we realized this is what the future of, of theme parks is going to be. And, and now we've seen it, obviously, with Diagon. Universal did it again with Galaxy's Edge. Disney is kind of adopting that same mentality. The, the most important thing that I learned from that whole experience was about ensuring that you're the master of every detail of that place. The only way a place like Diagon Alley is successful is if you, you remove the question of authenticity from the guest mind. This place has to be so incredibly believable. All the details have to be perfectly Victorian London, or the guests will fall out of the immersion. You know, our, our job as designers, and, and my job from that point forward, has been to make it easy for people to stay in the fantasy. And you know, again, you know, this goes back to another Stuart Craigism. If you don't believe the world is real, how will you ever believe the magic's real? And that that grabbed me right then. Like I'll I'll tear up talking about it now. But that was that was the big learning. I understand now that I'm gonna have to be flawless in my execution of everything I do from this point forward because that's the standard that's been set.